Hey, Pastor Dwayne, along with my beautiful bride, Cameron, we want to invite you into a Sunday service. This has been previously recorded, but it is one of our Sunday services. And this message, I pray, is going to be a blessing to you as well as the atmosphere of our congregation. So God bless you as you join us in one of our Sunday services. I felt compelled of Holy Spirit to come back and revisit a little bit of what we did last Sunday on the revolutionary rabbi in my attempt to try to write a sequel to Jesus the Rabbi, I'm trying to write that right now. <clears throat> you pray for me because I'm not a skilled writer. That's not my gift. I'm a speaker. So I have to work extra hard to do that. But God's grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. Amen. But in writing this, as you know, if you've, if you've attended here, if you've read the book, Jesus wasn't just the Son of God. He's not just the Messiah. But when he came to earth, the reason you don't read about him from age 12 to 30 is because he was in rabbinical school becoming a rabbi. All Hebrew people know that. If you go with us to Israel, all those tour guides and all the Hebrew scholars and all of the rabbis, they know that Yeshua wasn't just any rabbi. He was a rabbi who had a special status called Shmika or authority. And he was the only rabbi alive during his day that had the authority to interpret the Bible to the people. The only thing the other rabbis could do was recite what they had been told. And so here's this rabbi who has the authority to change the rules of Judaism, and he did. Yes. He changed them because he came to destroy religion. Right. Yes. Religion always causes an individual to look inward. A relationship with the Father always causes you to look upward and live your life outward. They were so concerned with keeping the rules of Judaism that the nation was going to hell. Do you understand that the ecclesia, the, the, the legislative body of the church, the church in America is so concerned with its doctrine and its ritual and its routine that the church has failed to be what Christ made it to be, and that is to look upward so that we live outward. Otherwise, the world's going to hell. Y'all yes. yes. can amen better than that. Amen. Most churches don't do anything outside the four walls. That's not true here. All of you are called, all of you prophesy, all of you have ministry, all of you are put here to touch someone else's life in some way. So last Sunday, I told you Jesus changed the biggest, biggest rule in Judaism called Zedekah in Matthew chapter 6. Remember, the Sermon on the Mount is his interpretation of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the Hebrew Bible. Jesus interpreted the Torah to them in the Sermon on the Mount. Everything he would do was an outworking of that message. Everything he would teach and say was an outworking of that message. The first thing he did was attack and remove their number one rule of religion called Zedekah, which means acts of righteousness. So in Matthew 6, he says, when you do your righteous deeds or your Zedekah, what was that? Praying three times a day, preferably in the temple at the hour of prayer, 
giving alms to the poor every week, and sitting in sackcloth and ashes and fasting one day a week. If you did those three things, you were a good Jew. Problem was, the average Jew couldn't do that because he had to make a living for his wife and his children. So Judaism had become a religion of the elite. Kind of sounds familiar in the American church. We create rules and rituals and doctrines and theologies that we can meet, but the average sinner out there can't. And so we're in a culture where the average sinner has thrown up their hands and said, I can't keep all these rules and I can't do all of these things and I can't live right. I can't do this and that. So I'll just stay lost. I'll just stay out in the world. And we've missed the whole purpose of why Jesus came and changed the rules of religion. And that is so that you don't have to keep a rule. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he said, there is a place in Christ, there is a place in the Father where you can go into your room and shut the door. And it's in that place the Father knows what you have need of before you even ask. These songs we sing up here, I don't know if you notice or not, but they're all singing from a perspective of past tense. I sought the Lord, and he has already heard me, and I already have the answer. Amen. And the answer is yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Amen. The answer for my health is yes. The answer for wealth is yes. The answer for influence is yes. I sought the Lord, and he said yes. And the yes is inside of me, and there is a place in him where he sets an atmosphere that creates an environment where everything I need is already provided. I don't mean to be unkind, and I'm not criticizing, but I have to tell you that if you're asking Jesus to meet, now hold on, buckle up, this is going to hurt anything that's religious in you, and that is, is if you spend your time asking Jesus to meet your needs daily, you're wasting your breath because Paul said, he has already supplied all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I brought this out. Now some, you know, I realize there are people out there that get crazy with some of these Hebrew items and they, they think it's super spiritual, but I want to show you something. To a Hebrew and to us, this is Yeshua. This is Yeshua, Jesus. He wore one of these and it, it, it was the only one of its kind. That's how they knew he was a rabbi with Shemekah because he wore the, 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 the only Talit in the nation that was worn by his teacher Hillel who had Shemekah. And Hillel died when Jesus was 18. And so you didn't even have to know who he was. When you saw what he was wearing, you knew that man has authority because he's wearing the Word of God. Hallelujah. And the Word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and his name is Yeshua. And the reason you see Christians, and I don't like that term, that's a, that's a religious term, the reason you see followers of Yeshua, because that's what you are as a disciple of Jesus, you're not a Christian. Once you come to understand that, you'll get set free. The reason you see today the ecclesia, the, the, the legislative church, keeping the feasts and wearing these and so forth is because we've come to understand that this is who he is. This, this tzitzi has eight knots representing the new beginning. It represents the fulfillment of 613 laws of Scripture. Jesus became the Word. This is Yeshua, the Word. Wow. And when he said, go into your closet and shut the door, I just wrote about this this week in my new book. He wasn't talking about your prayer room. He was talking about this. You've read in your Bible that Paul was a tent maker to supplement his income. He was a tallit maker, not a tent maker. They didn't live in tents. They, how beautiful are your tents, O Jacob, O house of Jacob. When you enter into that place with him, that holy of holies, when you enter into that realm where the atmosphere has set an environment where everything you need is already provided, 
When you wake up in the morning in him, he cre when you say the name Yeshua, when you say the name of Jesus, everything assigned to that name is already provided for you. And you've just set an atmosphere around your life that creates an environment where healing and prosperity and deliverance and the supernatural power of God is already at your disposal because when you wrap yourself in him and you're in that place, demons run from you when you're wrapped in him because they can't tell if it's him or you. The only way that you become exposed to the demonic world is to come out from under this atmosphere where the environment has set everything you need that's been supplied. And so by doubt, unbelief, fear, anxiety, carnality, fleshliness, when you get out from under this, you do understand I'm using symbolism. I don't mean wear this over your head to work tomorrow. But you clothe yourself in him and his righteousness. What, what is his righteousness? His righteousness is joy and peace and his covenant in the Holy Ghost. You clothe yourself with him. Is everybody all right? So he said when you go into that place and you wrap yourself in him, there is an atmosphere that creates an environment where everything you need is already supplied. And so you're living your life not inward about you. You're living your life upward for his name's sake and outward for his glory. And so he said in this manner, that Greek word manner, is literally in this new way or this new concept, he's changing the rules. When you go into your prayer closet and you shut the door in this place where your father knows what you need before you even ask, then what you do is you've come into this new concept that I'm about to give you, this new way of life. In this manner... You pray, but the word pray here is a very insignificant interpretation of prosukomai. Prosukomai in the Greek is translated worship. That's the literal translation. So when you go into this place and you worship, the root word of prosukomai in English means to puppy or puppy toward. Now that's weird, isn't it? Go ahead and just say that. It's weird. Who's thinking about puppy and having a puppy in the Bible? But if you have a new little puppy and you take that new little puppy and you hold it close to your face, what's that dog going to do? He's going to smother you with kisses. He's going to worship you because you're his source. You're his protection. You're his provider. You're his sustainer. He wouldn't be. You, you've become, when you take that weaned newborn little puppy away from his mother. Now you have become the caretaker. You have become the father, the mother, the supplier, the defender, and he worships you. And what he's telling us is Jesus says, here's the deal. If you want to get in this atmosphere where it sets an environment where everything you need is already supplied, what you do is you get up every day and smother the father with kisses. And if you smother the father with kisses of worship, then everything he has and is becomes yours at that moment. You become so wrapped in him, the enemy cannot penetrate. Matter of fact, the enemy runs from you, as I said, because he doesn't know if it's him or you. How many of you want to be so much like Jesus that the devil's scared of you? Well, then you just smother the Father with kisses. So you know this new way of life. Say it with me out loud, beginning in verse number nine. He said, in this manner, therefore, pray. Ready? Our Father. Say it with me at the same time. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, 
but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to zero in on the key to this environment. The key to you living in the overflow of his kingdom. That's what he says. Your will be done in my life on earth as your will for me is being done in heaven. Why does he say that? Well, because you, if you're born again, you are not really here. You're really already there. Your body's here, but when you got born again, you were crucified with him, you were buried with him, you rose from the dead with him, and you're seated at the right hand of God with him. So when this body dies, you don't go to heaven, you're already there. The body just goes back to the dust of the earth. And there is a place in him where you can, from the right hand of God, see with his eyes, hear with his ears, and do the works that he does in greater works because you're living life on this earth from an eternal perspective. I'm not trying to be super spiritual, but I'm just trying to tell you that God's will for you is originated in you in heaven first. And if you can become so consumed, wrapped up in him then you live that life 24-7, seeing with his eyes, hearing with his ears, feeling with his heart, looking at people through his eyes, looking at your circumstance. Why could Jesus go on and tell them, why do you get up and worry about what you're going to wear and what you're going to eat and where you're going to live? And he said, consider the lilies of the field and, and, and then consider the birds. He said, don't you understand that in me all of your needs are already supplied. You, look, you're wasting good energy and you're wasting breath and air and heartbeats to spend one iota of a scintilla of a second of your life being concerned about the bill that you have due and the job that you need and the, the miracle of healing that you're believing for. You're wasting your time. It's already done. It's already established. It, you already have it. So if your perspective is him, then you just get up every day and say, Jesus, I just thank you that I, I, I'm healed. And between the prayer of faith and between the manifestation, faith stands in the gap. Yes. And faith says, I'm healed. Amen. The doctor hadn't been notified yet, but he will be. <laughs> Next time I go, the test result's going to come back healed. Lord, I thank you that your perfect job is already, it's already there. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be there right when I need it. Mm -hmm. And until it arrives, I, faith's going to stand in the gap and lift my hands and praise you every day that it's done. Yeah. You see, if we're not careful, we can become so consumed with religious activity that we can read our Bible, fast, pray, do all the things that Jesus told us to do, but if we're not careful, we get into this mode of, I'm doing it in order to get God to do something for me. Right. As if he's some sort of ATM machine. Right. He's already done it. Right. It's already finished. And I'm just telling, I, I, this is n none of this is in my notes, so you may be here a while today. <laughs> I'm preaching to someone today who's living double-minded because you know the truth, you practice the truth, you're a tither, a first fruit sower, you're an alms giver, an offering giver, you, you, you've done all the right things in giving, You've done all the right things in praying. You fasted. You've prayed. You've stood. You've and, and it hasn't. The answer hasn't shown up yet. And now here comes worry, doubt, and fear. You have to stand in that gap yes. with your PhD, yes. past having doubts, and say, Lord, it hadn't shown up yet. But you know what? I'm telling you right now. 
If things get so bad in this country and in this culture that the water spigot is shut off and the shelves in the grocery store are bare, I know one thing. There'll be a rock in my backyard that'll give me a drink and you'll send quail flying into my yard and feed me quail from heaven and bread from heaven. You better come into this level of faith because things in this nation are going to get worse. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Listen, I thank God for the gap between the faith and the miracle manifesting because if I hadn't stood in the gap, I wouldn't understand that he's faithful. He's never left me. He's never forsaken me. He's dried the tears from my eyes in the valley of the shadow of death. He has held me up when I didn't have strength to stand on my own two feet. And he came to my rescue when I couldn't pay a bill or when I didn't know where I was going to turn next. Don't you understand he's faithful? If he doesn't see you through, if he doesn't see you through this time and this test, then he's not God. He's a liar, and we're wasting our time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I don't know where all that came from, but you. Here's the key. Here's the key. I told you last Sunday, my, my father, our father, Pater is the Greek word, pater, paternal. It means source. When you call on the name of God, you're saying my source. My father in heaven, Uranus in Greek, it's the atmosphere. My source is, in other words, father, I don't have to be concerned about my supply because I'm supplied with your heavenly supply as easily as I breathe air. I told you last week, if you have to think about breathing, you're sick. You don't go to bed at night saying, well, boy, I hope I breathe all night long, right? If you have to think about taking a breath, you need a doctor, you need a miracle, you may need a ventilator, you need oxygen, you've got a problem. One of my children, when he was little, had asthma, and it always attacked during the cold time of the year, and he couldn't breathe. And all I had to do was take him and put him in a hot, steamy bathroom, and then immediately take him outside in the cold and his lungs open, wide open. Because wow. I lived, we lived way away from any kind of hospital, emergency room, and I didn't have the money to pay for it anyway. And he would receive that miracle and his lungs would open. But between the time the attack came and that miracle of having his lungs open, it was tedious and he had to think about, he, he's, as a child, he's thinking about breathing. See, if you have to think about your supply, you're sick spiritually. You're in doubt, fear, and unbelief. Hello, I'm preaching better than you're shouting. Well, but, no, get your butt out of the way and stand on the Word of God. Stand on what God said. Well, but it's, it's so hard. Well, what does worrying do for you? It'll make you sick. It'll kill you. Stress. Jesus said, you don't, you don't have any worries. So how do I live that way? How do I live? Here's the key. I'm finally going to get there. My supply that's in the air that I breathe, hallowed be your name. There it is. The word hallowed is hagiazo in the Greek. It means to ascribe value and honor and worth. Amen. Hallowed, Lord, you're my supply, and you supply me as easily as breathing the air in the atmosphere, and I ascribe all the value and worth of my being and everything that I am and have to your name. The power is in the name. Yes. Amen. The key is in the name. But now watch. If you're taking notes, point number one. What I hallow in private is what will manifest in public. What I ascribe worth and value to in private 
It's easy to come in here in this atmosphere and jump and shout and give God praise and high five your neighbor and glory to God, I'm healed. God has supplied. Right now, your faith level is great. And then you walk out of here and life strikes you right between the eyes. And what comes out of your mouth when you're alone or when you're with someone who will listen to you, that's who you are. Don't tell me that you're living by faith when you walk around with a constant diagnosis of the moly grubs and how bad things are. Good. If you are depressed when you're alone, you're a depressed person publicly. If you're a negative creature when you're by yourself, you're a negative creature in front of everyone else. You may think you look different, but I got news for you. We can see through you. And the key to transforming your life is to ascribe value enough to his name when you're in private that he changes you in public. When that thought creeps in, but you kick yourself in the butt and say, not in my mind. I know who I am. I know what I have. I know what's legally rightfully mine. Amen. So whoever and whatever you are when you're alone. Look, it's not a sin for doubt or fear or anxiety to creep into your mind. A thought is not a sin until it becomes a transgression. Right. Till you act on it. Right. So you take every thought captive by the word of God, ready to punish, ready to kick it in the rear end out of your mind. Yeah. I understand what my mind's saying, but here's what the Word says. Now, there's the problem. Many of you, if not most of you, and certainly most all of them, you don't know the Word because the only Word you get is when you're here on Sunday. If you have to post the Word all over your house so that everywhere you look, it's the Word. you got to get full of the Word. I'm not even using these notes, but <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing. We can either manifest who he really is in the word. Karen and I thank you for joining us in today's broadcast where we previously recorded a sermon on Sunday and we hope it was a blessing to you to come into our congregation and our atmosphere on a Sunday morning service. Until next time, God bless you.